Okay. Let's try this again. That's better. So we basically decided to focus on the integrating with the web app, both inside the vehicle itself that runs on the, on the center console screen, touch screen, and also on the back end uh, web app as well. And, that and we also do CAN bus management to actually control the climate control system and set fan speed, temperature, et cetera. And we also obviously do the telematics link. We deployed one of our telematics servers on uh, automotive uh, or on a, on a Linux foundation box in the cloud to basically establish communication between the web side of things and the in-vehicle side of things. So just briefly go through what we actually did. Everything north of Exaport is inside the vehicle. Everything south of Exaport is on the Linux Foundation box and on the web. The communication link itself, well, since this was a quick and dirty one, it's a standard 4G hotspot setup, uh, no magic at all. We did not do any kind of uh, integrated uh, 3G dongle or something like that in, inside the NDIS box in the vehicle, which is because we were short of time and this was the easiest thing to do. So we have two main use cases here. One is that, I'm going to walk over here, inside the vehicle web, web app developed by Timo is coming up soon as well by Symbio, you set the fan speed, for example. We send a JSON RPC command over HTTP to our Exosense device running inside the device, uh, running inside the vehicle which basically forwards it to a demo app. And this is a couple of hundred lines of code. It's very, very small and compact. The demo app uh, emits a CAN message to the HVAC system to set the fan speed itself. It also forwards the, the command to the Exosense server, which forwards it to the back-end web app to update the interface that you're running on your iPad or your laptop or whatever. And the converse is also true. You can go from the back-end web app, set the, web, uh, the fan speed there, JSON RPC to the Exosense server. This, uh, this, this, since the vehicle is always online, we immediately forward it to here. We emit the CAN frame, and we also update the in-vehicle user interface as well. So what we did was that we basically, uh, again, we focused on the core telematic side and basically integrating between the two different user interfaces that were run in parallel and make sure that the commands sent by those user interfaces were forwarded correctly to the CAN, uh, to the CAN bus and the HVAC system. Matt Jones provided us with the CAN database, which was actually only a single frame and a bunch of bit fields. And uh, we both listen and, uh, and emit CAN frames there. And it it's, uh, was maybe six or seven hours of work to get that up and running. So basically, what we do for four labs, uh, to kind of move on a bit and why we're in this and why, why we're approaching AGL and JLR, is to basically we manage connected devices on an industrial scale. We do device management, we do traffic management. We route traffic to devices in uh, hard environments such as telematics where links may or may not be available, there may be a multipath thing, there may be cost constraints on how much data you can send in a month, etc. Our product suite is divided into two bits. We have the Exosense device stack, which you just saw in action uh, at the previous slide, which is uh, MPL v2, open source, and available for download and usage. And we have the Exosense server itself, uh, which is basically the device and the traffic manager. Now, I have to be honest with you and say the Exosense server is closed source and licensed by us on a, on a binary basis or hosted by us. But the Exosense device and the Exosense server communication protocol called Exoport is open source, and you're free to implement it yourself, and you're free to implement your own server, should you be unhappy with us. We think it's a dumb idea because our server is much, much better, but you're free to do so. And what we want to do as a company, especially in this crowd, is to lower the barrier of entry to set up your vehicle or your connected device. We want to be able to provide you with reference hardware, running Tizen or whatever you want, download our software stack, set up a demo account on our free server, and be up and running and touch your device, push software to it over the air within a day after you receive the reference hardware. Or if you run on a virtual box, just provision it, set it up, connect it, and get going. So if we look at the Exosense device stack itself, so it's Mozilla Public License V2. We have a bunch of reference hardware. The build is done using Yocto, which either produces RPMs that go straight into Tizen, or it can produce complete images for whatever Yocto hardware support you have. And we have a few reference hardware platforms we like from Embest, among other things, that actually have built-in CAN 
chipsets on them, which makes them very easy for us to integrate. And they're also automotive rated, which makes that we can take this one step beyond the demo act and deploy it in pilots as well. Um, even if we use Erlang as our core language, I'll get back to that, we, have, uh, we can support pretty much any language through a DBus interface that we have so that these languages can, uh, your local application running in a telematics device, in Tizen, for example, can receive RPC calls from the server, and it can access a local configuration repository from the server. And these applications can also be upgraded over the air from, uh, from the server. We provide full security through authentication and bidirectional encrypted RPCs using OpenSSL or similar. This depends a bit on what uh, communication link you're using. If you're using S uh, SMS, for example, which is a standard case, you need to tweak that a bit. So if we look at overview, this is a bit um, outdated. So the terminology ahead of all has changed. On your right side, you have the Exosense server, and you have your server application, which is usually a web server or similar that communicates using to the JSON router internally through JSON RPC. Now, the JSON RPC can then forward RPC commands to the Exosense device, which will then forward it to the device application. And it's full store and forward on the server side, so if the device is not available right now, it holds it until it becomes available and then forwards it. We can also monitor data, which I'll get back to through probes. We also have full configuration management, so that you, from a central point, can configure and manage a couple of million devices without any major issues. It's obviously overhead in, in so many devices, but it's definitely there. And that means that you don't have to worry about local configuration and how, how do I going to configure this specific device out there. We can push out the configuration data and make it accessible from different configuration systems. If you need to set up your Apache server or something else, we can basically export config data locally. We have data acquisition modules for uh, AD converters, GPIOs, etc. Uh, so we can sample. We obviously have CAN bus integration. And your device, your device app has full access to all these components. And if we di dive into the stack, again, this is outdated. Some things have been added. Some things have been not implemented yet. <coughs> At the bottom, we have the Linux kernel with our device driver and file systems. We're on Erlang at the bottom. And there's a long, separate seminar on why that's a good idea. And then we have basically a bunch of components. And when you build the Exosense device stack, you can specify exactly what you need in order to minimize your footprint so you don't have a lot of bloat. So we have a graphics manager, which uh, some people may want if it's more embedded graphics and it's a weaker system that can't run a full HTML5 stack. Configuration management I mentioned. We have NMEA0813. We have CAN bus with socket CAN, and also actually CAN open implementation in open source as well, which we believe is a first. We have the full backend server communication with encryption and everything. Data acquisition, I2C, which we haven't implemented, RPC management, and monitoring. And on top of this, you can write your application either in Erlang or through DBus access in any language you want, C, Python, or whatever you fancy. Briefly, the service stack. Since this is not open source, this is the only slide. It's device and traffic manager. We also do package and configuration management, so you can upload packages to a repository in your server and push these out to the devices over the air, make sure they get installed correctly, and also update the internal database so you know what is running where on which devices. We can do mixed assets. So if you have several different device types of different hardware revisions, vendors, protocols, communication paths, et cetera, we do that as well. We, can, we know what your data plan is so that you can uh, basically avoid getting dinged by over data if you have to push out a, a big firmware upgrade, for example. And all the interaction with this goes through JSON RPC admin, RPC calls to be forwarded to devices, et cetera. So it's a single point of interface. So I'm going to make an example out of how to use this with a recall case study, which is, uh, is basis in a, in a real world recall that was done a couple of years ago. And I think if you remember back, you know what I'm talking about. So basically, we're looking at a case study where we have a deployed fleet of vehicles, a uh, million vehicles, for example. And suddenly, you start to get intermittent reports of failures. Uh, brake failures, for example, and it could be, and I pressed the brakes, nothing happened, or I had to stumble, and nothing happened. You cannot recreate it. Somebody crashed, you got the vehicle in, all the logs are cleared, no error codes, no events, nothing out of the ordinary. So you don't really know what's going on. 
and you don't really know if it's software, hardware, or mechanical. And worst of all, you have uncertainty. You don't know what to tell the press when they start to see this and they start to call you and say, hey, what's going on? There's like five people who claim that the brakes didn't work. And you have very little data to go on. You get in the occasional crashed vehicle to your lab, you disassemble it, but you can't find anything wrong. Everything looks okay. And there's obviously huge pressure on engineering in this case. How are we going to solve this and get it out? So what we can do is that we can design, if this happens, for example, let's say that you have an issue with the TPS, which is the throttle position sensor, you can design a monitor package or a probe that basically looks and sniffs passively on the CAN bus waiting for anomalous situation to occur, such as both the brake pedal and the throttle pedal being depressed at the same time, which is a typical case. That normally never happens. When the probe detects this inside the vehicle, it will start recording everything just a big debug dump of all the CAN data, dump it into local storage for later transmission. You design that probe, you drop it into the telematics server, the Exosense server, you transmit it to the vehicle where uh, over the air, ask the guy or the owner is driving, the girl is driving, and it now silently sits and monitors the CAN bus in read-only mode, looking for this anomalous situation to occur where both the brake pedal and the, TPA and the throttle is depressed at the same time. When that happens, we have a fault detection, and the telematics device, through its probe, starts to record everything that's going on. 30, 40 seconds later, or when everything is released, we immediately call home and said, vehicle VIN 1234 had this issue. Here's all the CAN data from all the sensors as the issue was happening. And now, you suddenly have two megs of data from a situation that definitely should not happen. It's a very, very strong indicator that this is actually a, you caught a use case or a default scenario in the wild as it happened. And you can now ana analyze it. So if we look at the conclusion, basically shortens the root cause location time, and we can immediately, for the OEMs, can say, we saw this, we're a bit worried about it, we decided to push out a probe to 10% of our vehicles, to 100,000 100, vehicles. Give us a week, because that's the time frame the estimators, we're going to catch it. And as soon as you have the data, you can see this is a mechanical issue, this is a software issue, that's even better because we can now design a fix and send it out over the air. And we don't have to do a recall. This can be done over the air if it's software only. So this is what we can provide through AGL. And we try to, we obviously try to kind of establish ourselves here as a company, we're a young startup, etc. We thought that one of the better venue was to give out this device stack as open source and actually enable this level of functionality to anybody who wants it. We obviously hope at the back end that somebody is going to license our server technology as well and use this, uh, which is because we still have to make, meet payroll somehow. So we thought this was the right venue to push this technology out there to get as much exposure as possible. And the JLR demo that we did right now is the first very small step of this. And that's pretty much it. Um, I guess I can take a few brief questions now. That bad. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. So we work both within and outside AGL. Uh, so what I told Matt is that we'll have a look at an automotive message broker. And have, I, I, it's a normalizer, basically. It takes, it's a pluggable backend through the CAN bus, Ethernet, or whatever you have, and reads sensor data and frames from that. It could either be an a, a AD converter or read sensor data and normalizes it into standardized messages, which have yet to be standardized. So Matt is working on that. So, which is needed because we need a common uh, terminology to decide that this is actually RPM or torque or center box <coughs> diff temp or something like that, center diff temp. Um, so what I told Matt is that we're happy with that. We'll integrate with that. And in the AGL case, we'll just basically drop the, the CAN bits here and we'll remove that from, from our mix when we build for AGL. We're not kind of tied at the hip to our own technology. We integrate with whatever we find. We are f 
fairly communication agnostic, so we take whatever channel, channels we have. Again, this may overlap a bit with other, with the conman and other connectivity issues, but we have a full network detection system in place inside the Exosense device stack that detects when Wi-Fi LANs come on board or 3G connections, PPPs come up. And then we, we start using that. We signal that back to the application and say, hey, you now have an IP link. We have these three links to, use between, to choose between. You can now start transmit data. And by the way, this is how much data you have left this month before you start to have to start prioritizing your traffic. So if a, a P link comes up, we can use that as well. We obviously probably need to integrate with the lower level Netlink drivers, or P link needs to integrate with Netlink in order for that to work. But the framework is in place to handle that as well. So we, we try to be as agnostic communication as possible. So we can either do old kind of AMPs, uh, uh, burst technology if you have an analog link. We can go that far back if need be. I hope not. But. Okay. Thank you very much for your time.